am here to talk to you all about the special month, which is April, and April is Minority Cancer Awareness Month in Texas. And I want to thank all of you for being here, and I would like to recognize and thank the sponsors of our legend, the American Cancer Society, the American Lung Association, the Texas Medical Association, the Texas Hospital Association, and June the District. Uh, April is not over, so stay tuned. We have more to come as we continue to roll out uh, this program for Minority Cancer Awareness Month. We have information packages for you, and my hope is that you will leave here knowing more than you did before about how cancer affects different segments of the populations, how this impacts Texas, and some ways that you can help the people in your district and others. Today our speakers uh, include uh, my dear friend and colleague, Representative Myra Crownover, Commissioner David Lakey from the Department of State Health Services, Dr. Deborah Pat, the immediate past chair of the Texas Medical Association Cancer Committee, and Dr. Lorna McNeil from the Department of Health Disparities Research at the MD Anderson. I can tell you, hearing that I have had cancer rock my world, it really did. And I had stage four and you know, it doesn't get any further than four. You get to one, two, three, four is it. And it had mes mes metastasized all over uh, the right side of my body. And it had gone to my brain where they found six lesions. And I had to have uh, about 15, sessions of radiation for uh, the full brain. And they say that, you know, once, once you have that, you can never have it again. So the doctors better know what they're doing when they do that. <laughs> because if they don't, then you can end up being uh, all kinds of things. And you can end up uh, being uh, like you had a lobotomy, and it is something um, something that's really scary. But I can tell you that I've been in remission for several years, and thanks to my excellent uh, medical care and constant prayers and support from my family and friends, and I feel greatly greatly, greatly blessed. Yeah. And as they say in my church, and highly favored. <laughs> in turn, I feel it is my mission uh, to try to help others. And as a cancer survivor, I am keenly aware that cancer is a sneaky disease. I learned firsthand how important it is to pay attention to signals in your own body. It's like sort of playing football. The best defense is a good offense, and regular checkups are critical to good health. That's how you and your doctor can tell when there is a change that should not be ignored. To protect good health, ignorance is not bliss. It is really a health hazard. Here are some things we should know. Minorities are more likely to die of cancer. Unfortunately, minorities continue to have 
lower screening rates, report less physical activity, and consume a less healthy diet than others in the population. The effects of cancer are unequal between racial and ethnic groups. For example, the lung cancer rate is highest among African-American males, more than other males, and more than females. Also, lung cancer kills more African-Americans and Hispanics than any other cancer. Cancer has a ripple effect beyond the patient. It affects the workplace. Treatment can disrupt family stability, which means uh, it uh, disrupts the relationship between moms and dads, and it can be, it disrupts the relationship between children who um, get cancer, and they have to have, and you know, kids are so dependent, and we have to have uh, people who are loving and caring to be able to work with these children. In everyone's interest, it's best to help in every way that we can to decrease the frequency of cancer in all populations, and especially the mort mortality rate among minorities. I want to thank you again for being here for lunch and now I want to ask uh, Representative Crownover to share her thoughts with you, and then we will have uh, Dr. Pat and Dr. McNeil and Dr. Lakey. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ruth. It really is a uh, joy and a blessing to have you and Denver here. We have uh, for you to share your story. It's an unbelievable story. So uh, you're a, a living miracle, and through prayer and research, and great doctors. So we are grateful to have you here today. We're also grateful to have everybody else here in the room today. I know you're busy people and you have other things to do, but I appreciate having just a moment of your time. I'm Myra Crownover, State Representative from Denton, and I have, I have worked on the uh, smoke-free workplace bill. We've passed it in the House several times, can't seem to get it passed in the Senate. So um, I, I would love to make our case here. You know, uh, screening is so important, and good medical care is so very important. But if anyone in this room could choose just never having the problem, and having to deal with it. Of course you would choose never to have the word cancer by your name. It changes everything once you have been diagnosed. So um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And we have made, um, I have been very depressed the sessions that we were not able to uh, let allow Texas to be a smoke-free workplace. The bill that uh, I have filed repeatedly is not at all about the consumer. The consumer can go anywhere they want to. The bill that we have filed has always been about the employee. The employees should not have to choose between their job and um, their paycheck. So I think it's very, very simple. It's a, it is a liberty issue. It's not your liberty to go smoke and make somebody breathe your secondhand smoke. It is our liberty being Texans to breathe fresh air and not have to donate our personal health for somebody else's convenience. So I think it's a very, very strong message. I have been depressed that we haven't passed it because I know lives are depending on it. I have also been uh, empowered that just the conversation changes. I've had people come back and go, you know, two years ago I thought you were so wrong. And they come back and said, now I get it. I see what you're saying. So it's a very slow, I'm not telling, you know, the bill that we were talking about does not tell anyone not to smoke. Now there's a very good answer to that question. And many of my personal friends are smokers and they are struggling as hard as they can. You know, acupuncture, 
psychotherapy, all sorts of things to try to kick the habit. So the best thing is to never have the habit. But there's some really important um, information here. Number one, we did an extensive, or not we, they, um, did an extensive study and for the state of Texas, if we would pass the smoke-free workplace in just two years, we would save $30 million in Medicaid spending alone. Just Medicaid, just Medicaid. So I think uh, as um, somebody that's responsible to the state of Texas, I think it is an absolutely way, way, way past time. I've been delighted. Uh, I represent the University of North Texas. Their whole campus, 36,000 students have gone smoke-free. So it's a smoke-free campus. All over campus, they have these beautiful feather kind of uh, flyers with the UNT Smoke Free Campus, and I, I think that's a game changer. And, and so we're in the, we're in the middle of changing the way we think about it. I've got some statistics that the Vasilis um, organization did, and in 2013, 74 percent of Texas voters supported a smoking uh, smoke free law. 74%, what else calls it 74%? Maybe motherhood and a few things. So uh, I think it's, and here's even more startling. You go, tea party, well they won't be for it. No, they call the tea party, 67%. Tea party understands we respect other people's rights. We don't just demand our own rights. So I think it's a wonderful thing that, that we have the opportunity to do. Um, there's some wonderful speakers today, and I'd rather listen to them talk than to me. So thank you, Ruth, for asking me to be here today, and I look forward to gathering some more great information. Thank you so much for taking the time to have lunch with us.